Islamic art. <clears throat> so in this next lecture, what I wanted to discuss was going over some of the ideas that influence Islamic art and um, the development of it. And so we need to look at the religion first and look at some of the main figures who are involved in the religion and how they influence the art that's produced by the Muslim world. So the first figure that we need to look at is this guy named Muhammad. And Muhammad was a prophet according to Islam. And he lived in a place called Mecca around 570 to 632. And he was actually uh, a camel trader who was a merchant who was traveling around into Israel and other parts of the, the world and became very familiar with a lot of the philosophies, religions, ideas, and languages uh, of the world. He actually did not read and write but he was a really smart guy. So basically what happened is um, at one point, Muhammad, who was married to actually his, his former boss's wife, starts receiving messages uh, from Gabriel the angel. And what happens with these messages that he is receiving, these recitations, is that it's a message to him and to the rest of the world that he needs to reform the religious world and start a new religion. And a lot of the ideas that are communicated to him um, are written down in the Quran as word for word recitations that he basically memorizes what Gabriel says to him and then he has someone else write it down. And a lot of the ideas involved with, with the Quran and with uh, Islam is that there are these people of the book and the people of the book are basically Christians and Jews, but they are in, um, they're actually heretics in a way, or their beliefs are her heretical, meaning that they don't really quite understand what was going on in terms of the religion and that uh, Muhammad has had Gabriel come and visit him to correct all of the misunderstandings. And so the Quran actually is, you need to do it word for word, and the term Islam means to submit or surrender to the word of God. Now, one of the ideas behind it then that has a relationship to Christianity and Judaism is the idea that it's a monotheistic system where you have a certain set of ethics that need to be maintained. And that this ethical monotheism is that you believe in one God who is everywhere and in everything, sort of, you know, like the Star Wars force, and that he, this God, wants you to do the moral thing and do the right kind of thing. So the pillars of Islam are actually meant to design so that you behave yourself in a really uh, ethical way and behave yourself in a way that's appropriate. The pillars of Islam are basically where you need to pray several times a day and, and that is part of a uh, you know, five times a day and you pray towards Mecca. The other thing is that you need to actually kind of go out and witness your faith and some other things that are kind of uh, important are that you need to basically take care of people who are not as well off as you with a sort of uh, charity, the uh, sakat, which uh, a lot of religions have that involved. And then you need to purify yourself at certain times with, by fasting, especially during Ramadan. And that's something very much in common with a lot of faiths. And then, of course, you need to make the pilgrimage to Mecca, where there is actually a uh, the Kaaba, which is this um, basically a meteorite that has been carved into a big box. And uh, originally the faiths in the area where uh, Muhammad lived uh, around Mecca and Medina were basically these, um, the uh, faith that was sort of animistic that there were uh, spirits and, and uh, sort of almost like uh, creatures who were part of nature that lived in the desert. And so he reforms all of that. Now, another interesting component of Islam is that at one point, um, uh, Muhammad is invited to go uh, live in Medina and he agrees to go there as long as everybody converts to um, to Islam. And then 
the religion becomes so popular that he actually is invited to come back to Mecca. And then the, there are a series of sort of semi-religious little battles and things like that. But basically the idea is that everybody submits to Islam. And because it's so based in the written word in the Quran and you need to be literate, uh, you have a very literate culture that is spreading out across the desert and across the um, the the world that they knew as Arabia and Persia, and then into Egypt and into Africa. And so what happens then is eventually you have a dominant religion that even makes its way into Spain and controls some things. Because it's a literate religion, and it's a literate culture that's based in intellectuality, and that the main idea is that you need to stick with the Quran, which is clearly a recitation that should not be changed. You have a very intellectual culture that has a lot of um, texts involved and texts that comment on the Quran as well. And that becomes important in terms of the art. Now, this also relates a little bit to the Christian and, and uh, Jewish tradition of the Ten Commandments and the Second Commandment is that you're not supposed to actually um, make uh, a graven image of anything on the earth or uh, in the sea and that kind of thing. And that is kind of taken to another level in the, uh, the, in the Islamic faith. However, uh, let's begin first by taking a look at the different kinds of texts that develop out of the Quran and out of this tradition. So there are actually, I think, four or five different kinds of scripts that evolve. And this makes sense because you have this calligraphy. And the word calligraphy really um, comes from the root which is kalos, which means beautiful and good, and grafos, which means to write. So it's beautiful writing, and it takes the place of actually visual illusionism. Now, one of the other things that is uh, an influence in this is that we see some uh, designs and decorations that are geometric designs because the Arabic trader would have been dealing with geometry and mathematics quite a bit. Now, the next thing is because you have such a literate culture and you have people who are reading and writing all the time, a poetic tradition comes up. And so what you have then also is a series of poets who combine beautiful writing and poetry at the same time. And so we have inscriptions, for instance, like on this dish here, uh, which is take the middle road in your affairs. Indeed, it is a salvation. Don't ride it a too gentle mount or too obstinate a one. And the idea behind this is that you have beautiful writing that communicates real wisdom and that in the beginning is writing and the word, which relates directly to the Quran. The tradition changes somewhat uh, over time. And so we're looking at a much later an 18th century manuscript page here. But I think that uh, it really communicates the end evolution of a lot of the ideas that happen with Islamic art. And so when we look at this page, um, it, it's actually uh, from the Kudi album. Uh, it's by Muhammad Ali, and it's an Indian um, uh, Islamic uh, piece of art. It has the original text um, in one area, and then it has commentary text surrounding it. So you have the different forms of texts and different forms of scripts that are all combined in a way that show that you have this commentary on the original text itself and some, in some interpretations or expansions on the original text of the Quran. The other thing about this is you also see that after a time that some of the rules that govern whether or not you can show things that are literal depictions of things, and this is called an aniconic tradition, is that you start seeing botanical designs and botanical texts. And um, that is still sort of an iconic. It's not really um, something that you would worship. It's not a person or an animal. Uh, and so we start seeing the development of not only geometric designs, but also botanical designs in Islamic art. The other thing that you're going to start seeing is a term called the arabesque. And it just means it's sort of Arab-like. And it's a, used, a term that's used to describe the actual calligraphy, the writing that has a sort of Arab feel to it. And, um, and any kind of linear design that looks a little bit like calligraphy is sometimes referred to as arabesques. One of the things that I think is significant and when we compare the um, tradition that comes out of Islam 
to the Christian tradition of manuscript writing is that you can actually see in traditional Christian manuscripts, and this is an early one that we're going to be studying a little bit more in depth, is that we have actual pictures that take the place of beautiful writing in the Arab tradition. So in a way, the reason why pictures are often included in Christian and Byzantine manuscripts is that sometimes people just couldn't read and write and they needed the pictures as reminders of the story. So we're talking about the difference between a literate tr tradition and an illiterate tradition. And even though there is writing involved in the Christian tradition and there are scribes who copy out manuscripts and rewrite things, we have a, a much different attitude towards picture making and designing of the pages, at least in the earlier phases of early Christian versus Muslim kinds of art. Now, one of the things that I learned about in terms of the Indian tradition of making art is a tradition called Musawir, which basically is the idea that you show people who are honored um, sort of leaders of the community. And this means that in some areas, the anti-conic tradition, the, the edict against depicting real things uh, that could be confused with real life is relaxed so much that they actually start just showing scenes of Muhammad and scenes out of the Quran and things like that. But even so, even with this relaxation of some of the um, the uh, traditions or the rules about the anti-conic tradition, what you'll see sometimes is depictions when they show Muhammad, they actually white his face out because they don't want you to be able to imagine or picture mo what Muhammad looks like because he's too holy. It would be it would be really rude to show the prophet. And so whenever you see a manuscript with a whited out face, it's usually a very, very important uh, figure, for instance, like Muhammad in this instance. And we see it over and over again, depending on the actual geographic region. But I think what's also an interesting idea about this aniconic tradition and the whiting out of the face is that it still is very close in some ways to Byzantine art because it's not about illusionism. It's not about creating deep space. It's not about showing light and shadow and cast shadow and that kind of thing. So in the Islamic tradition, it's very much like the Byzantine tradition and the early Christian tradi tradition of making images that actually depict um, things that are realistic because if you look at all three of the faiths Judaism Christianity and Islam the world that we live in right now is not so great and that um, if you were to sort of aggrandize or romanticize or even depict the real world it would be kind of a negative thing because you get your real reward in the afterlife when you go to the afterlife as well so this image on the right hand side of the ascent of the prophet is going to relate to a building that we're going to look at later because at one point Muhammad actually is lifted up to heaven and ascends to heaven. And I think uh, an interesting detail about this is we have the sharing of images of um, literally angels that come all the way from ancient Greece, which is centuries before. And we even have a sort of centaur like creature that is lifting Muhammad up to heaven and the halo that he would have this, this sort of uh, illumination of light that's surrounding him that we see is not a Christian or Jewish tradition of showing this sort of circle or this glowing thing. It's actually almost like his head is on fire and it's a, it's a, a wreath of flames around his head. The architecture of religious buildings in uh, the Islamic tradition is also a really important part of the world and part of the art world. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the different plans and the different styles of, of mosques. And so I want you to think, first of all, that the mosque is a much more democratic kind of structure than the um, Jewish synagogue or the Christian church. It's basically, you have um, a, one wall that has a sort of niche in it that's a, the wall is called the Qibla, and then it has a mirab in the, in the wall. And what you have is it's facing towards Mecca. And so everybody goes into this religious building and you have uh, someone who might lead the prayer, but there is no uh, sort of rabbi or priest who's actually completely in charge of the flock. You can, you can have a mullah, you can have someone who does deliver a sermon, but the prayer that you know you do five times a day, what you do is you kneel down on the ground on a carpet and you press your forehead to the floor in submission to God's will. So the Qibla wall um, is pointed towards Mecca as a sort of reminder that that's where it all began. And so the entire structure is designed so that as many people can and will just sort of go into there, set their, their carpets down, and then pray towards Mecca and, and to God. So we see different 
styles of footprints or plans for mosques. And so, for instance, we have one that looks a little bit like a basilica and has a san in the front, which is basically kind of like a little courtyard. Then we have one that is uh, actually sort of a freeform, open flowing structure that, uh, that, that we see that is almost kind of a, um, a structure that is loose and, and improvisational if you think about the floor plan. And then we have one that almost kind of has a pantheon or a central church type plan that has a dome floating over the, se the center. So all of these plans are sort of renovations or corrections of original schemas of Christian, Greek, and Jewish synagogue plans because Islam is the last religion to come after that. The decorations that we find inside the uh, the Qibla wall of the Mirab, um, this one is from the Metropolitan Museum. It's probably one of the most famous ones, and a lot of people have seen it. If you look at it, it has a series of, of calligraphy that run around the um, borders of the of the Mirab. Then look a little bit closer, and you can actually see there are botanical and geometric designs that relate to the earlier tradition. So both of these relate to the uh, traditions of calligraphy and um, also the tradition of being literate and reading and writing, and also relate to the um, Arabic merchants and Islamic merchants who were very versed in mathematics and geometry. And then we see in the center of this little, little prayer niche that kind of looks like the Torah niche that we looked at um, from Dura Europas, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where Qiblas came from, the, uh, the Mirab in the, in the Qibla wall, uh, we have a little um, script in the center. And so the whole idea is that you need to be able to read and understand the words of the Quran, and it also has an idea in it that the mosque is basically the house of God and that everybody should be there. And if you want to be in the house of God, that if you're pious, then you live in a mosque in a way in your own world. And that's going to also relate to the use of traditional carpets. Now, I also want to suggest that if you look at this capital from Hagia Sophia, the botanical symbols, uh, uh, the botanical carvings and the intricate carving and geometric design that we see from Byzantium is probably influencing a little bit uh, Islamic art in general. And we can kind of see where they're building on earlier traditions, again, that schema and correction, and using a lot of those geometric ideas and those kinds of designs. So if you look a little bit more closely, I think some of the things that you'll see are, for instance, you, even though these are plant-like forms, they're still very symmetrical, balanced, and mathematically based. And you'll also even see arabesques running, for instance, in the sort of uh, pointed arch that we see here running around the interior of the, to the, um, the Qibla niche itself. Now, the next uh, mosque that I'd like to study for just a minute is the mosque at Cordoba in Spain. And one of the things that I think is really important is that the mosque itself is there's no prescribed architectural form except for to have a, um, a, a, a Qibla wall and a mirab. So you can have a large hippostyle or, or a columned hall. And in this instance, what we see are a series of arches that are sort of duo colored, they're, they're two tone. And then we see um, columns on them. And if you look a little more closely at the columns, one of the things that you'll also see is that each one is a different height and slightly has a different style. So what I'm kind of suggesting when you look at the, uh, the columns here is that why are they all so different but and why are they using the arches? So let's talk about it from an iconographic point of view first. The use of arches is actually something that symbolizes technological mastery. And we can also see it in this, uh, the ceiling on the right hand side where we have this sort of um, shell-like floral um, design that's carved out complete with geometric designs. And we see the use of um, arches throughout Cordoba and the use of domes as well, which shows that they have a mastery over the science and mathematics of earlier periods. So in a way, it's honoring the building by using these sort of advanced concepts. Now, the other thing is that the columns are all different heights and different sizes and slightly different orders and different carvings, because what they did was, in order to build the mosque, they went around throughout Spain and throughout Cordoba and actually collected up as many columns as they could to complete the building itself. And they sort of used the arches as a unifying theme throughout the entire building.
Now, the other thing that I think is, uh, is significant is actually the correction on the uh, dome-like design that, for instance, remember the Pantheon had these coffers kind of carved out of it and they were to relieve um, uh, weight and that kind of thing. But we see here in this dome that has been uh, designed and, and decorated with uh, intense uh, decorations and actually the, the guy who did the mosaics on the interior uh, was imported from, from, from Byzantium and was a Christian um, decorator. We see a little bit of Quranic text running around the uh, interior of it. And then we also see this use of these sort of geometric uh, ribbing that might also eliminate or move some of the forces from the dome in the center. And then we see a sort of ornamentation on the dome that makes it almost a floral or a shell-like design that is a way of kind of advancing the original dome-like pattern and showing how fancy that they can make it. And this is, anytime you see something that's really decorated in, for instance, any kind of religious art, it's a way of glorifying the God that they're worshiping. And anytime that you decorate a religious building, what you're doing is it's a form of devotion and a form of worshiping God. And I think that anytime that they're using something that is uh, an advanced technology that's taken from an earlier period, what you're doing is you're, you're even ornamenting that tradition and, and devoting it towards uh, an honorific symbol towards God as well. So I'd like to take a look at the carpets next. So we're looking at uh, just a basic um, Persian carpet and, and I was speaking with one of my students actually who was from Iran and at one point she told me that most uh, Iranian families actually have um, carpets even if they don't have furniture and she explained to me that um, carpet is very important in a Middle Eastern tradition because the carpets are basically furniture and bedding for a lot of people. And this makes a lot of sense because you would use a carpet even in a mosque to pray and you need to put your head down on, on that carpet. So you need to have something that's kind of soft that you can nestle your forehead against. The other thing is it's also used as a, as a sort of transportable house or a bed. And so what we see here is that one of the things about the nodding and design of Persian carpets, um, and you can read more about this in Marilyn Stock's Dad's Art History, which is assigned for this class, is that the Nodding is a way of designing it so that it is a really um, thick, comfortable kind of uh, weave. And so it's a textile initially. The other thing is that the colors and the dyeing is very expensive. So yarns and wools that are used to make a, a Persian carpet can also increase its cost and increase its value as well. And the amount of knots that are actually knotted into the carpet, which make it denser, also increases the cost. Now, in terms of the design that we see here, I think it's a perfect kind of unification of some of the traditions that we were talking about in terms of the architecture and also in terms of the manuscripts that we were looking at, the Quranic manuscripts and the Kufic script that was the poetic script as well. First of all, you see arabesque designs being sort of filigreed throughout the entire uh, carpet. And then the next thing that you see is botanical designs that are not completely realistic or illusionistic. They're heavily influenced by geometry, so they're not really real. But you see a little bit of illusionism in which this uh, sort of tripartite arch with the pointed arches and a, um, an incense burner is hanging in the center, which make it almost look like someone's home, which influences the fact that this is sort of a transportable mosque. And then in a way, in spirit, you're always inside a mosque every time you pray. So returning to the architecture again, what I'd like to do is talk about a central plan mosque. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to Israel, to Jerusalem, and we're going to look at a central plan building, which is part mosque, part monument. The Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is located above the western wall of the original Jewish temple, and it marks the location of where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And he was, um, and there's a rock that even has some dents inside the, um, or, or an impression inside the mosque itself. So first of all, uh, from the exterior, you can see it's a gold dome, and that it's a dome shape. And remember that. If you trace the evolution of uses of arches and domes, a dome is an honorific symbol that means eternity, it's continuous, it also symbolizes the dome of heaven. But the other thing that it also represents in some ways is a mastery over technology. So they're building a building that is using technology that honors what it houses.
If you look at the exterior of the Dome of the Rock, you'll see that it's sort of a hexagonal and geometric form with a, a drum in the center and the dome is placed above that. And on the exterior, it's heavily mosaic, and that's just like the Qibla niche uh, that we looked at, um, uh, the Mirab that we looked at from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's going to have um, a series of mosaics and Quranic script running in registers around it, and you also see geometric designs. But you also see the use of arches that are sort of almost drawings. Even though they're architectural, those arches really don't hold the space up. They're just honorific symbols in a way that run around the, the external uh, portions of the building on the lower register. We zoom in a little bit on some of the mosaics, you'll see that mosaic is a, is a really good way of making something that is permanent that you don't have to repaint. Um, and it's also using uh, dyes and colorants that we saw that are very valuable. For instance, a uh, cobalt kinds of uh, mosaic is uh, it was fairly expensive, but it's also extremely beautiful. And we see Quranic script running around the exterior of the building. So the building itself, just like for instance, the Parthenon or other churches that we're going to look at. It's kind of a sermon that runs around the exterior and you read the architecture of the building. This instance, since they are a literate culture, you literally read the building as, as a series of scripts. The next thing that you'll see is surrounding and ornamenting the, the script, which is the center of the religion, the Quranic script. You'll see a series of botanical uh, designs that are sort of altered or stylized in a way that are geometric, ge geometrically stylized. And this makes them less illusionistic and more about decoration. And so they're not actually, it's still in the aniconic tradition in a, in a really strict way if you think about it, because you have flower designs or floral designs, but they're definitely meant to be geometric designs and not meant to be illusionistic. The interior of the Dome of the Rock, um, this old postcard really shows it very well, that's why I liked about it. It has a series of arches, and remember we looked at that in Cordoba, so this series of arches or an arcade that runs around the center of the building. And then in the center of the building is the rock that Muhammad stood on and ascended up to, to heaven um, from. And we see a sort of two-tone design, like in Cordoba, we, we see it, uh, the arches are surmounting um, uh, sort of Corinthian style columns. And then uh, in the center of it, almost like a jewel is the rock. So if you think about it, that rock is almost a diamond and the, the building itself is the setting for that diamond that's, that's uh, in the middle. When I went to go visit the Dome of the Rock in Israel, one of the things that was a little disappointing for me was the tour guide pointed up at the ceiling and said that uh, a lot of the decoration that you see in the ceiling is actually wallpaper. So I don't want you to get the feeling that all of it is mosaic, but some a good portion of it is. We also see um, stained glass that's that's used throughout it. That's actually, I think, a later addition. And then we see um, these sort of botanical garland uh, kinds of designs that are like vines, and that's used in um, we, we see vine-like designs, for instance, in ancient Rome in the Arapacus, then we see it in uh, Christian sarcophagi, and then we see it again um, in Christian um, manuscripts because Christianity is a vine that grew throughout the world, and I think Islam is the same way. If we move down the building, you can see a little bit more closely the arcade and the mosaic-like style of using different kinds of stone. And the columns themselves are actually different kinds of stones. So we see a lot of polychromy. We see a lot of different kinds of stone, and, and the building is almost completely in some ways. Um, so we see these arches that are basically using arch and dome technology and using the concrete and cement that we studied from ancient Rome to um, make a Muslim building. And so we, we see a build from the schema to the correction of later cultures. The building itself is a sort of hexag hexagonal structure. And if you think about it, it's a layer cake. You have an outer wall that is almost standing independently that doesn't really relate or support the inner hexagon that happens and doesn't really support the dome on top. It does a little bit if you see how the, the, uh, the timbering of the roof connects up with the dome that supports the golden dome on the top and, uh, and pushes against the drum. So we see a little bit of a Hagia Sophia-like buttressing from the exterior and we see uh, uses of arches to hold up 
um, I guess what you'd almost call the architrave of the internal and exterior structures. And then you have a dome that's sitting on a complete drum that could probably stand on its own without the exterior support. The overall footprint of the building is, if you look at it, it's a central plan that is almost like the Pantheon or central plan churches that we're going to look at in terms of Christian building and Catholic building. And the center of it where, for instance, we would call the nave or the place where you would have where people would gather for prayer um, is actually the rock that uh, Muhammad ascended from. Now, if we think about the influences of this building and the kinds of ways it's supported, it should remind you a lot of a building that we studied just before from Byzantium. The building that I'm comparing it to is San Vitali from about 550. And if you look at San Vitali, it has a very similar kind of structure where you've got a series of outer walls, semi-supporting in a series of interior walls with a sort of dome-like ceiling over the gallery in the center or the central dome area. But the dome is not as complex, it's not as fancy as the Dome of the Rock. And if you look at the dates, there's a reason for that. It's, you know, the Ravenna really is built around 525 to 550, and the Dome of the Rock is built um, long after that.